are here to worship with us this morning at the West Kenton Presbyterian Church. Yes, we know it is quite chilly in here. The thermostat does not seem to be working uh, the way that it should, so send your prayers at it. It's right over there behind Diane. In the meantime, no one's going to judge you. You need to keep your coat on or go back up to the car to get something warm. Hopefully the Lord Jesus Christ will keep us all together, but we are so sorry to show you here and we are working to fix So I just have a few more announcements other than that. Um, the word is that no one signed up for this member class is supposed to happen today because of, you know, scheduling issues. So we're going to try a different path. If you're interested in becoming a member of the church, fill out one of the forms in the office, and then I will work with the people who sign up to find a date that works for us, um, as well as a couple members of the membership committee who will be part of that class. So there's a form in the church office that is new member four. If you're at all interested, it's not a commitment um, to become a member to sign up for, but if you're interested in learning a bit more about the church and what being a member entails, please fill one out. The nominated committee, which is an incredibly important ministry at the church, is looking for a final member. Now, I just finished my Presbyterian quality class, and the only way that Presbyterian church works is through electing people to serve on the various boards of the church. Now, that work is mostly done by the nominated committee on behalf of all of you, and I have brought to you. If you are interested in being an integral part, of the Presbyterian denomination as a whole and ensuring that it continues as well as serving the church, please consider joining the nominating committee. It's incredibly important work. If you are interested, please contact um, Amy Wood. I don't think she's here today, unfortunately. Um, but please, please speak to her or you can speak to me if you want to talk about it today. We would love to have you as part of that work. Other announcements? Ms. Gale, she's back there and excited. Yes. The Presbyterian women pledge five thousand dollars a year to the church budget every year, and I'm pleased to announce that under the dedicated leadership of Chris Hatt, the sale yesterday met an almost half of our pledge. Wow. Wonderful. <laughs> so uh, Big thanks to everyone who helped out with the treasure sale for Chris and Dad and headed it up for all of you who schlepped stuff in and sold things and bought things and schlepped it out. We are so grateful and it netted a little under half of $5,000. We can do that. But the present year is going to be the church each year. So congratulations to that group and a huge thank you to all of you who helped. Any other announcements this morning? Uh, okay, so the board is sitting on a chair over here. So, um, I tried, I changed that one. <laughs> so our second is number 374, not 375. So just figure it out. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Thank you, Linda, for catching that. I never catch this stuff. Thank you, team. Any other announcements this morning? Small or large? Then friends, let us feel the warmth of Christ spread over our bodies, and let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship this morning.
please rise and join me this morning's call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise the Men, women, all people alike. Let us praise the name of the Lord.
this morning the scripture comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the word of the Lord. I love the scripture passage I just read for you. It's from the Gospel of John, and I love the Gospel of John. It is short, and I like short. (laughs) But most of all, I love this scripture passage because I picture it as a glowing candle in the darkness. It is a command to love one another, even as we live in the reality of a violent and painful world. John tells us a lot here in only a few short sentences. And as a pretty short-winded person, I admire that. We hear about glorification, departure, and the command to love one another as a sign of being a disciple of Jesus to the world. This passage comes right after Jesus predicts Judas' betrayal and right before Peter denies him. You've got to remember that John's a little different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This command to love one another is like a candle in the dark in danger of being blown out by the betrayal of Judas and by the denial of Peter. It reminds me of just how fragile the good news of Easter is in a violent world. We are now in the fifth week of the Easter season. In each of our lives, the good news that Jesus Christ has conquered death and sin is susceptible to the sheer wear and tear of daily duties and disappointment. It becomes a little easier to forget the promise and hope of Easter as we slog for summer, as beautiful outside as it may be. We are so susceptible to the immense pressure and pain of the world. Places of worship are attacked, innocent people walking down the street are no longer safe, our only children in school are no longer safe. Is it any wonder that the Easter season seems to erode and even explode as the weeks of Easter pass us by? What is this one command to love one another in the face of all the darkness and hatred? What is one man rising from the dead in the face of all of this carnage? For one thing, I think we need a good dose of emotional honesty. It's okay to admit that the joy of Easter now seems a little bit distant. I'm sure many of you have heard the saying, all good things come to an end. Lots of good things wear off this time. Why is Easter feeling different? The effects of medication wear off. The dizzying excitement of new love eventually subsides. Nope, does spoil. All good things come to an end someday. Jesus tells his disciples that he will not be with them much longer. His earthly ministry is about to end. And so he instructs them to love one another as he has loved them to continue his ministry. So where is the, I have, as I have loved you, you should also love one another type of thing in our world this week? There's another old saying that I really don't like, but I thought I would put in this pretty act. What can't be cured must be endured. That was one from my grandparents, because they endured a lot in their life. I might not like this thing, but it can be true. Things that I would love to have come to an end. Pain, regret, addiction, prejudice, grief, violence, sense of suffering. Unfortunately, the announcements of bombings, violence, natural disasters are no longer surprising to us. 
We have a feeling of we've heard this before. There is an apprentice, there is a relentlessly enduring quality to the tragedy and violence in our world today. I'm going to switch tracks a little bit here. There is a wonderful book called Stations of the Heart, Hurting with His Son, who, which was written by a man named Richard Leischer. Probably not pronouncing that right. But he offers an account of the illness and death of his young son Adam due to cancer. He talks, he's a pastor, and he talks about the homily that he preached during the wedding of his son before he became ill. He was actually pretty happy with what he said, except for a comment he made at the time. Someday, Adam and Jenny, someday you will be old. Still human, but old. And at your 50th wedding anniversary, you will hold hands and ask, how did we get so lucky? What you will really mean is, how gracious God has been to us. In light of his son's death, he thinks about what he said and he writes, I think preachers should speak only what they have been given to say and not a word more. They should not pretend to have a privileged view of the future. They should hold something back against the night. What do we hold against the night in our world today? Not the main hope for a future free of violence and love and loss. We hold the promise that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and is present through the Holy Spirit to empower us to love one another, assured that God has actually won the victory over the ruler of this world, death. This is a promise that we can hold against the night even as anger and fear rages all around us. And it is so unfortunate that so many in the world consider the church a part of fear and pain in the world. As I was talking to the kids this morning about what Christians look like, and friends, it's usually not us who can hear this picture, but angry people with signs yelling outside various institutions, people raising millions of money on TV. The church as a whole doesn't have a very positive image in our culture. If I were to set up a kiosk at the local Costco to interview people who don't go to church, I think most of us would be pretty disappointed at what people have to say about why they don't go. There are a lot of people out there who have been burned by a church or church people at some point in their lives. Mm-hmm. Some would say that everyone in the church is hypocrite, that we overlook our own sins while sharply criticizing other, others of theirs. Others might point out how different churches and different Christian people seem to always be fighting each other over incredibly insignificant things. Those of us gathered here know that is not the whole story of church. There are plenty of people in church who practice the compassion and mercy of Christ on a daily basis. But that doesn't always translate to the perception that many people have about us. Jesus tells his disciples that the, the defining mark of their life as his followers was to be their love for one another. Is that what people think of when they hear you're a Christian? Your love for others. This is not just the warm, fuzzy type of love that we get when we sing familiar hymns together. It's a willingness to humble ourselves to do for one another what we would normally not do. It is the decision to give ourselves away for the sake of another person. It is the commitment that our lives are to be lived not just for ourselves, but for the benefit of one another. This love is incredibly difficult. It is a love that many Christians have not decided to shoulder because it's so hard. It is the ultimate tough love. The love that Jesus showed us is a love that is willing to do whatever it takes to meet the needs of another. It is a love that leads us to make sacrifices for one another, even when it is unconventional, inconvenient, and uncomfortable. The love that Jesus commands us to have has always been tough love. Christians are divided by race, class, politics, and dogma. All of these divisions are completely against what Jesus said to be our disciples of faith. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if 
you have love for one another. Because we come from different perspectives and backgrounds, the kind of love that Jesus commands us to have and show is tough. It takes everything that we have to give. In a world that is increasingly lacking in love, it seems that maintaining this tough love for one another is the most important way we can demonstrate the new life of our risen Lord. The flickering candle in the darkness has burned brightly in those who have shown love for one another. Those who run towards explosions rather than away. Those who help and who comfort. Those who search for those left behind. Who encourage friends and family during times of grief. Who say the unpopular things for the sake of others with no voice. The candle burns brightly for those who seek to identify and offer community to isolated and misguided people. If we only read these four little verses in John's Gospel today, we must face that Jesus is already and it's all on us now. It is up to us to elevate the world by the power of love for one another. Is that possible? Probably not. But these four verses are not the entire story. The bigger story in the Gospel of John is that Jesus is, as promised, still present through the power of the Holy Spirit. Still present as we offer the love Christ commanded us to others. The resurrecting power of God allows us to love one another, even our enemies, even those who dislike, even those who see us to affirm that love is stronger than death. What is something that we hold back against the night in John's Gospel? It is not that all good things come to an end. It is that what can't be cured, violence, hatred, and sorrow, will one day be redeemed. And in the meantime, as Jesus has loved us, we also should love one another. Amen. We're now going to stay together an affirmation of faith, which comes from the author. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, and in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is the poor of all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might come and have first place in everything. For him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile all things whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of this cross.
show love for one another is by lifting up one another in prayer. One of the most powerful things I find is when I'm having a hard time with someone to pray for them. It can be hard to keep someone returning to work. We also lift up prayer to those who we love and cherish, praying for their healing and their comfort. I also I have one prayer to lift up before I open it up, and that is we pray for all those who have lost someone who are still in time of grief. This morning especially pray for Tipper. He left behind friends and family who care. And we ask for prayers that he is resting in peace. Are there other joys, concerns, prayers to be lifted up from any of you? Oh, sorry, Diane. I'm going to It's on my heart today. Pray for friends and loved ones and people throughout the world from COPD, the fear mm-hmm. of losing your breath and struggling to breathe. Just in this heart. So we lift up all those who struggle with the ailment of COPD. Breathing is something most of us take for granted, but when we're struggling to breathe, it is one of the single most terrifying experiences. And those who live with that fear and that anxiety and that problem every day is incredibly heavy burden, I would think, for them and for those who watch them struggle to breathe. So we lift all of those people up in prayer. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Here's my daughter, Gary, and her husband, Max, and baby Jack, who played this week, they drive across the country to California to be doing the tour. Wonderful. We pray for Gary and Max and Jack. How old is Jack now? Six months. Six months old. Oh, that would be so cute. We pray for them as they drive to California. I would say Jack has been and done things in his days have not done. And his parents are pretty incredible, which is usually partially a product of great grandparents. <laughs> so we certainly lift up up the prayers they rejoin the tour and we just thank for the time you got to spend with us all of them. Thank you. Yes. My good friend Rich Raider is recovering from open heart surgery. You pray for Rich Raider? Rich Raider. We pray for Rich Raider as he recovers from heart surgery. We pray for prayers of healing and for comfort as he begins to call. Thank you. Any other prayers to be lifted up this Then let us pray together. God of wonders, we give thanks that you are good, and your mercies are here today and will endure forever. We praise you not only for the sweeping design of this universe, but for the subtle blessings of every day. You have made us to delight in you. Each morning we await the choices to see our day, whatever it may hold, as full blessings from you, or to view it with a cloud of vision of trouble leaving. Teach us to fill our minds with what is true and good, what is authentic and gracious. Keep us from dwelling on all the things that can overwhelm us with fear or anger or negativity, moment by moment. As we rest deeply in your presence, we acknowledge some of the hidden failures that often escape our notice. Our reluctance to speak up with humble strength when we see injustice, the time when we have made quick judgments without knowing all the facts, our easy rationalization of excusing ourselves the same faults we criticize in others. Remind us of our constant need for your free and forgiveness, and then out of gratitude, help us to offer the same freedom to others. Gathered in your presence, we lift you the needs of the ones closest to our hearts, but also the situations in this world that cry out for you, for the ones who are navigating end-of-life decisions, for those who are consumed with worries over struggling children, for those who are facing fearful uncertainty in their work or relationships or health, for the pain that we see all around us. Wherever we are, when we seek you, you meet us at our place of need and offer us the resources to face this moment. This morning, we lift up in prayer, Tipper, that they may rest, rest in peace. We pray for all those who are affected by COPD, who feel such stress and anxiety to just breathe. We pray for all those who are chronically ill, for their caregivers, and for their loved ones. We lift up Siri and Max and Jack as they travel back to California. We lift up Rich Rainer as he recovers from surgery. 
Well, God, we pray that your spirit will enable us to breathe deeply without fear, that you would bring deep relief to the hurts we offer to you, that you would inspire us to courageous hope because you are with us. We ask these things that we might live purposefully, so that we might be able to impact our world with your mercy and love. In the spirit of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's see. This morning we are going to have Christina Ravenhall come up and speak to us about the Pentecost. I apologize because although there are inserts in the bulletin about the um, the Pentecost offering, there are supposed to be envelopes in the queue, and I don't see that. Um, but the Pentecost offering does um, run through Pentecost Sunday, so um, hopefully there will be envelopes there in the next few weeks and you can uh, utilize the envelopes then. Um, I want to give you a little background about Pentecost offering. I think this is the second year that our church has done this. Uh, previously, we participated in one great hour of sharing, peace and global witness, and Christian joy offering. And at um, Reverend Clepper's suggestion a couple of years ago, we talked about it, and mission has voted that we will participate in all four of the special offerings, which includes uh, Pentecost. So, now I'll read to you a little blurb from the secretary. Uh, the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. I bet some of you remember that song from the 80s. It's called The Greatest Love of All, and what greater love is there than God's love to children? The chorus in that song goes, The greatest love of all is happening to me. I found the greatest love of all inside of me. I was sunny, but I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Without serving as a Presbyterian young adult volunteer, Cherokee Adams experienced the greatest love of all. She said that during her service, the Holy Spirit took me and changed me in ways I wasn't expecting. Now Cherokee hopes to go to seminary and be a pastor. She wants to share the great love of the greatest love of all, God's love, as it was shared with her, as with, as, with as many people as she can touch. It's so important that we support young people like Cherokee because the foundation of faith, established during childhood through young adulthood, helps ensure lifelong faith and service. The programs we support through the Pentecost offering helps our youth, Church of the Future, to embrace the true meaning of God's love in their own lives. Perhaps Carly, a young woman from South Dakota, said it best when we call her own experience at the Presbyterian Youth Planning. Before confirmation, it was like you went to church because your parents did, but now you have a more personal connection with faith, she explained. Then we went to training, it became even more personal, and it was amazing to see all the people who were there sharing the same faith as I did and felt the same way about it as I did. The Pentecost offering is also dedicated to helping children at risk. One such program is Rising Tide, an after-school ministry of Covenant Presbyterian Church in Long Beach, California. Those who come from helpful and supportive families experience Rising Tide family as a supplementary family, explained Reverend Rob Langworthy, who co-founded the Rising Tide with his wife, Reverend Adele Langworthy. Others who don't have that kind of family at home find Rising Tide as their source of support and inspiration and guidance and encouragement. Forty percent of this Pentecost offering stays right here on our own church so that we can provide support, inspiration, guidance and encouragement as well. Bottom line is, through our gifts to the Pentecost offering, we are sharing the greatest love of all, which is God's love. And what better gift could we possibly give our children than the gift of faith and love to last a lifetime? It has been said that gratitude follows grace like thunder follows lightning. In response to God's gift of unconditional love and ongoing creation, we now offer our hearts, minds, souls, and strength to the one from whom all blessings flow. This morning's offering will now be
Heavenly Christ, come and dwell, dwell together in your Holy Spirit with all your children. May we shape the next generation even as we are shaped by them and transform each of us to the power of your love. Amen.